Okay, can everybody hear me? We're going to get started here on um, Argonaut Data Query for Fire R4. Okay, I am, my name is Eric Hawes, MSD of EM, one of the few veterinarians you'll see in this space, but here I am. Um, so <clears throat> I'm a primary editor of the Argonaut Data Query, got all the Argonaut guides, along with my partner in crime, Brett. And Brett unfortunately couldn't be here. He was originally slated to do this talk. So I apologize if I can't keep up his high standards. Um, <clears throat> so we're both self-proclaimed fire experts. I've been around, and Brett's been around quite a long time. We are the, I'd say we're the second tier. You had the, you know, the, the, the godfathers of fire. You have Graham and Josh and Awood and Lloyd. We came around like right after. So we're at kind of the, the second level there. So we've been doing this for a bit. Uh, we were way back when. We took over the uh, Argonaut Data Query. Um, IG development from Josh, who was doing a great job. He just was like overwhelmed with so many things. And we helped bring that into, inform it into an IG and been working on several other Argonaut guides since then. But now we're back to the Argonaut Data Query IG for R4. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we started out with, with the Argonaut Data Query IG in uh, uh, DST2. And here we are again in R4 land. OK, so I'm going to give you a little background on Argonaut. It's going to be very brief. I think you, if you remember a couple lectures ago, Mickey kind of covered some of this ground. So I'll go through that relatively quickly. Uh, we'll talk about data query. We'll talk about how it relates to something called US Core, which is an HL7 artifact, whereas data query was an Argonaut artifact. And then we'll talk about the future of Argonaut and US Core. <coughs> OK, so and again, uh, Mickey went over this before, Argonaut project. Um, what is it? It's an implementation community, um, private sector initiated and funded, collaborative work. Um, we're not a standards, we're not an SDO, we're not a proprietary activity uh, or a separate legal, legal entity. We bring a lot of the work we do back into HL7. Um, Brett and I kind of try to be the, um, we're trying to be the, uh, what am I trying to say, the, uh, the regulators in terms of trying to keep things in Argonaut within the constraints of HL7. So we try to act as facilitators, but also kind of constrain it to like what we think it should be based on HL7. So we have that, that role as well. <clears throat> and we talked about this for a bunch of vendors in, in the project. I don't know why Mickey's slide is prettier than mine, but it is. Um, and then we also have, we met Mickey at the, at the, the talk previously. Uh, other, other authors, we Dixie Baker helping with security, Josh course has worked in all this as well as Graham and 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 Jennifer who's helped us keep keep us um, on time and, and our things going and it's kind of our communication liaison with all the uh, with all the members of the Argonaut community okay so and the Argonaut process well, it helps resolve practical problems so we have what search criteria to use for a particular use case we have operations and examples. We want to know what type of data will you get in the response to that. So we want to have some, some familiarity. We want to have some consistency when you go across, across vendors, across um, not just across vendors, but across um, 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 data providers, EHRs, clinicians, so forth. If you can get some consistency as an app, then you, you, it goes a long way. You're not writing a new API for each, each individual endpoint. And then we want to know how that data is going to be represented. So we have the idea of, of, a, of a common structure, at least a common minimum bar of a, a set of data elements and a, and, a, and a structure that you have. So you have some consistency um, across, across the space, across the healthcare space. <clears throat> so the signature event in the Argonaut project was um, publishing the Argonaut Data Query Implementation Guide. Um, it was access to individual data elements in the common clinical data set. That was back in Meaningful Use 2015. That's what he called them, the CCDSs, as we used to call them. Um, and um, also in that guide, a little known fact maybe, I don't know. Does anybody know that we also had a way to access uh, the CCD, the, the um, what does CCD stand for now? Com Do you know what CCD stands for? It's the CCDA. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's like a summary document. Um, 
and then also leveraged all the OAuth uh, to base security and authorization work that was done through Argonaut and through Smart. So we had this guide that came out, this, and we call this is colloquially known as the Argonaut Guide. There's going to be a lot of name changes. You drive down the street, sometimes the road sign changes, right? It changes from, you know, Maple Street and it turns into, I don't know, Main Street. Uh, well, in this, in this lecture, we're going to cha start changing the name of the same thing. It's going to change its name mid midstream here. Um, so now we call this the Argonaut Guide colloquially. It's actually formally the Argonaut Data Query Guide because we have a lot of other guides that, that the Argonaut community has produced. And they are, but we ca still call this one the Argonaut Guide. Okay, so here's our name change. We're driving down the street and all of a sudden um, our name goes from Argonaut Guide to US Core. So what happened is we took the work of the Argonaut Data Query DSTU2 guide and we took it to HL7 and we, <clears throat> we made all the changes so it would be conformant to the STU3, of, STU3 version of FHIR. Because remember, Argonaut guide is the STU2. Then we took that, we said, let's make this into an STU3 guide. And, and um, so we did that and we validated it and we got it approved and published, and it became the, the um, HL7 US core implementation guide. So, so the bottom line, at the bottom here, is that the Argonaut guide in its Fire SCU3 form, you can consider that to be called US core. Um, it's built from the same Argonaut requirements, and in fact, as I think about it, I don't think we just basically took the same guide, we didn't actually you know, strip something out or, or change it. We actually just took the same guide. There's the same content is in both guides. And then we took that guide and we kind of updated and added new things to the US core guide. So um, <clears throat> when we talk about the Argonaut guide, that's DSU2, US core becomes STU3 and beyond. And then we were very aspirational with this US core guide. We thought that we, we designed it so that it could be used by the US stakeholders when implementing fire. So we'd have a common set a very, very basic set or minimum set of, of uh, structures that, that US core implementers could use so they'd always be used as a basis for creating um, uh, further US realm profiles. That was our aspiration. That's why we called it US core. We weren't, we weren't um, trying to grab that. We grabbed that name because we were trying to be aspirational and say we should, we should have this as a baseline for all our US core realm products. And that was our aspiration at the time. <clears throat> So if you made another guy say we have a guy called US, I don't know, we, I'm going to make one up. US, say you have US, um, uh, well, I have one, I'll make one, uh, US medications. And in that one, you want to call out um, your profile for a medication request or a medication statement resource. You would start as a, as a building block, you'd start with the US core medication statement resource and build on top of that. That was the intent and that's why we, we went with that name and that's why we, we chose, uh, chose that route. <clears throat> okay, so now driving down the road even further, we go from Argonaut DSU to US core STU3 and then you know, the, we go past another, another uh, traffic signal and all of a sudden the name changes to US core. Well, actually it stays the name, it stays the same, but, but we're just advancing to um, uh, Fire R4, we didn't change it to R4, but the, but the idea was US Core was an STU3, and then we upgraded it to become uh, consistent with the FHIR R4 standard. As the underlying standard um, advanced and the version, versioning uh, came, went from STU3 to R4, we kept up with US Core going from STU3 to R4. And we added a few things at that point. We added some, uh, some new profiles. And you can see I highlight them in yellow. Some are name changes, but um, in R4, where we're at today, um, we have, um, as you can see, a few more um, profiles in there. We have stuff in there because of USCDI. There's a couple down there at the bottom, pediatric BMI, pediatric weight, and those are because of regulatory, uh, new regulatory constraints. We added some, I would call them, um, administrative resources that weren't part of the original SDSU2 because that was really designed to, to um, encompass the regulatory um, requirements at time, which were the, the common clinical data set. It didn't include things like practitioner or organization or location or um, <coughs> practitioner role. 
So we've kind of wrapped some of the other work into there that you need to be a more complete um, um, set of profiles. And then a couple more that were added in the latest round. Encounter was added. And um, you can see in there there is a um, US core diagnostic pro profile for report and note exchange. That, what that means is we added clinical notes into, into um, US core. And it's not only covered by that one, but it's also covered by the document reference. But you don't see that in my list there. So we've expanded it to cover US CDI requirements and also to give us a little more functionality across a, uh, a broader space, but still trying to focus on the most, the core resources that um, you would need for, for interoperability. <clears throat> Just a, a few notes about the process for this and how it works in, in, um, in HL7 and pull the curtain behind away so you can see how HL7 works. We, we take these, uh, these artifacts, we, we, we edit them, we write them, and then we put them up for a ballot by the community. And, and then we take all the comments and we go into committees every week or by email or, or hook a crook and we try to resolve every comment through a, through a consensus process and have it voted on by the, the appropriate committee. And so we went to ballot in January 2019 with our latest version of US Core, which is based on Fire R4. And then we've just um, fin we finished ballot reconciliation, <coughs> excuse me, in late April, and been working um, to get everything applied and getting it published. So it's, it's actually, it's actually sitting there ready to be published. The final step for publishing is about to take place. And so I have here published in June. There's a long tail sometimes of getting these published, but we're going to have a, a uh, HL7 US Core Implementation Guide SU3 um, published and out there. We have it. It's actually out there and waiting for it. And we have, it's called the Continuous Integration Build. It's, it's ready to, to be published. So it's, it's there. It's just not formally published yet. And again, here I'm reminding to remind me to, to tell you that the big changes in this guide from the STU3 version are going to be uh, clinical notes. We've added we'd add the ability to um, to search and, and, and query for clinical notes, and also we have some ONC requirement required um, um, data elements, including pediatric, pediatric BMI and pediatric weight, and so those are in there as well. There's a lot of other. Substantial changes in terms of look and feel and, and trying to straighten out some of the, the guidance, but it's, it's, it's not as substantive as these two here. <clears throat> okay, so why do we need profiles? Why do we want profiles? Why is this a good, good thing? Because you don't need profiles to interoper interoperate with, with fire. Um, the resources are discrete enough. Um, you can consume all the ed ed elements you know, map into from recommended terminologies, um, and expose those capabilities. So um, that you can always do that without profiles, right? But um, it turns out you'll start getting people drifting from each other, and you'll have um, not one standard, but a standard for each implementer, because all these decisions will be made independent of each other, and you'll start, you'll start having a situation where there is no interoperability, and there's no benefit to um, having a standard. There's no, there's no standard API. You have to go. It's a one-off for each, each um, implementation. <coughs> and, and, and you have these base, you have base condition, uh, you have base resources such as the condition resource I'm showing here. And in the standard fire uh, specification, there's a lot of elements and there's a lot of zero to ones. There's a lot of optionality. Everything is kind of like, yeah, you can use it, you don't have to use it. And that's on purpose because of a base standard, you want to have a, a lot of flexibility there so that you can tighten the constraints down for your implementation. So in our US core or Argonaut um, resources, we make a few adjustments to that and, and tighten it down for a few elements. And so in this case, for US core condition, we've looked at it, discussed it, and came up with a set of, let's see, there's a half a dozen, there's five, five elements there, data elements that we feel should be <clears throat> uh, the, the minimum standard, the, the kind of the floor for interoperability among um, the um, implementers includes statuses, it includes categories and the code. In this case, it also includes the patient. We're talking about patient access here, so oftentimes you'll see patient. I think patient's always in all of our, in all of our profiles. Um, and then you have those bright red S's there. That's uh, a way to indicate that you need to support this. And um, so there's some conformance um, 
some conformance uh, um, mechanisms we use in our structure definition to say, this is mandatory, or this is something that if you have it, you have to send it. So you got it, you send it. And that's, um, that's the way we do that is, if it's mandatory, it means it always has to be there, then our cardinality is gonna be uh, minimum cardinality, that, that thing says card on, on, the, on the screen up there. It, it, um, it would be minimum of one. If, you, if we wanna say, if you have it, send it. Because sometimes you don't have the data, right? We can't force you to send something you don't have. But if you got it, you gotta send it. Then we use the zero to one. Let me just see if I can point to that here. It's a must support. That's a must support right there. See, it's zero to one, and here's a mandatory one to one. And that's just a notational thing, because your minimum, if your minimum is one, then it means it always has to be there. If the minimum is zero, then it's, 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 it's a, it doesn't have to be there. But by, by tagging it with a, that S, by saying it's a must support, then we're saying there's additional rules about this element, and that's what must support means. It means the additional rules, in the case of US core, that's what must support means. It means basically the short, shorthand version is, is if you have it in your data source, you gotta send it. So it's, it's different from mandatory because in mandatory, you always gotta you have it. Yeah, a must support is, it's like if you know version two, HL7 version two, it's like a required, but can be empty. It means you got it, you send it. If you don't have it, then you get a pass. It's hard to test for that. You have to actually give people the data and then see if they send it back to you. Um, okay. <clears throat> so if you look at the guide, here's the Argonaut Data Query Guide, the version DSU2, and it's pretty much the same in US Core. It's laid out the same. We have in our guides, the home page tells you all about it, and then we have a section called General Guidance. And in the General Guidance section, we have... Um, um, in the general guidance section, we have um, just overall um, issues about how to implement this for there's, there's things, there's, there's issues or, or um, implementation notes that we want to cover all the resources. And then uh, we have, and I, I highlighted and started as red, we have a section or a menu item called profiles. And in the profiles section, um, in this particular style of guide, the, this, this profile section contains a lot of, of, of text and, and implementation notes on how to use each of the resources. And also has a section called Quick Start, which is really about search. So when it comes down to it, this, this style of guide is really a lot about structure and search. And when I say structure, it's about the, the, the resource structure definition, which means what elements do we expect to see. And then we also talk a lot about <coughs> How, what search APIs, a, APIs are going to be supported for that particular structure. Um, there's other um, artifacts in the implementation guide, um, including extensions that are US-centric extensions. We'll look at that in a second. Um, a lot of information about value sets, <clears throat> because one thing about a jurisdictional guide is every country probably has its own set of values they use based on their, how they've evolved in that country. Um, and so value sets are a way to bind, bind codes to each individual resource. And so it gets to be, it's pretty significant when, you, when you're talking about um, a jurisdiction to, to define each value set specific to what that jurisdiction uses. So for example, you know, for medications in this country, I think we use Yark's norm, which isn't universal. It's, it's specific to the United States. Um, there's other things in there about, so I talked about it before, there's a lot about search in, in the data query and US core guides, because we talk a lot about search, so we have a lot of search parameters in the more recent guides defined and specialized to, to accommodate, um, <clears throat> accommodate our search requirements. And, and, and again, I wanna stress that we're talking about, in these guides, we're talking about the minimal requirements. We're not saying you have to only do this, we're saying at the very level, lowest level, do this. Okay, so in our general guidance section, we talk about things that apply to all the, the, the resources, all the artifacts that are in the guide. And some of the things we talk about in there would be mapping um, um, the resources to 
the regulatory requirements. Um, for example, in, in, the, in the Argonaut guide, we talk about uh, the common clinical data set. And in the latest US Core uh, R4 guide, we're talking about the US CDI. And we, I mentioned this before, must support. Must support is described in there. Um, and here we have the base fire guidance. I kind of summarized it before. Um, in the base fire spec, we talk about must supports. And it says, when a profile does this, it shall make clear exactly what kind of support is required. So we describe that short version. If you got the data, you send it. Um, and if you receive the data, you can't create an error. Um, <clears throat> but in, in, in reality and truth, if you look at the guide, it takes us about six bullets to say this because you have to really craft it carefully to give a fully, uh, fully uh, expressive uh, capabilities of what the must support means. We talk about codes in the general guidance sections and, and what the different codes and bindings mean and what to do if, if something's missing. Um, we actually created a, an extensible as max, by, max value set, and I'm not going to get into that too much, but just to say, we wanted a say, way to say you have to use this code set or you can give text. But we didn't want, to, want you to try to um, give, and this was, this was basically a, a way to do that. And so um, either give a code or provide text, but you can't give us an, an, extensive co an extensible code. So yet these three codes, for example, use these three codes. If you don't have this code, <clears throat> send us text. That's kind of a unique feature. Um, <clears throat> and we talk about other code systems, such as using UCOM, and, and, and we talked about missing data in there as well. <clears throat> so here we have a, a little table of uh, US CDI to US core profile mappings. This is taken out of the guide. If you look in the guide, it's a little more extensive than this. There are some gaps because we have a little more work to do on, on mapping in the, the remaining US CDI elements. But we do make an attempt to, to provide very clear and specific guidance to what is in US CDI, CDI and where is that, is that captured in, in US core profiles. <clears throat> okay, so if we take a deep dive into one of the profiles, and like I said, we have a general guidance section, and then we have a list of profiles. And in a list of profiles, we, we really are specifying the structure and, and what the data elements look like, how they're, how they're bound to value sets, and we talk a lot about search. So in each of our, each of our profiles, we have a nice human-friendly prose section. We actually handwrite that out and say, you know, you got to support this, this, and this, kind of in a, in a more ca casual, colloquial fashion. Colloquial fashion. <clears throat> we say you got to have these mandatory elements, you got to have these must supports, and then below that we have a more formalized definition, which I'm showing here in the screen, where we actually show a little tree structure, and this just gives you um, a snapshot, uh, not a snapshot, but a, a, a differential view, just a delta of what actually is being supported there. We call that the formal view. And then Below the, the formal views, we, we show what's called a quick start, quick start, which gives you all the search requirements. Uh, the, the shell, you shall support this search or you should support this search to really try to nail down what the expected um, capabilities are for each of the profiles. <clears throat> we also have, so this prior view here, it's, it's the tab, you see differential view up there. This is the so-called differential, it's just the, the delta of what's actually supported, and then we also provide you, and just good to know, the full view just gives you that, that um, in the context of the entire resource, it kind of highlights um, how it fits in the entire resource. So when you look at these and you click on those tabs, you can see um, differential, full view, and the first tab there, text summary, just gives you the same information, in a, actually gives you a differential view, but it, it writes it out in a paragraph form. Some people like words, other people like pictures. It's, it's to give you a choice. Um, <clears throat> can actually, and then here's another profile, and I wanted to spend a little time in this profile. This is our US Core patient profile. And, um, <clears throat> and so here I want to point out that we have added a couple things that are unique to our country. We like, like to record race and ethnicity, and then there's some regulatory requirements around recording sex, sex and gender, yes. Those are extensions, yeah. So why does it say extension? Well, this is, this is a, a, a symbolic representation of that. 
And the, the way you would know that as an extension is if you um, click on it, it'll, it'll click to an extension. Or if you, know, if you recognize the little, um, there's a little star asterisk next to it, that's a symbol that says, hey, this is an extension. <coughs> yeah. So this kind of simplifies and abstracts some of that information. But if you click on the links to that, you'll see it, it's an extension. But so that's, that's a great segue. So in, in our patient profile, we actually do add extensions. And so in the US, in, in, the, in the fire core specification, um, there's no concept of race or ethnicity in the patient resource because it's not a universally accepted um, need. In some cases, you don't, you can't have it in some countries. So, so in the U.S., however, we like to record that. That so we have created U.S. core specific U.S. specific extensions such as race and ethnicity, and then <clears throat> another regulatory concept called birth sex. <clears throat> So we add that into our profile, and then we also have another set of uh, things like identifier name, gender, and, and newer ones such as address and um, um, phone number. And I mentioned Quick Start a few times. Again, U.S. Core is a lot about search. So we have a Quick Start section. Here's, here's what it kind of looks like. So we have a set of mandatory search parameters that we list, and then we have a subsequent section that talks about the um, 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 must support search, must support search. Um, I have to look at it. So we have shalls and shoulds, and, I, and mandatory is not the word I want here. I'll have to look at it. But there's another section that says mandatory and then should support. I think it says should support, should support these search parameters as well. So we define a lot of these things for a couple reasons. One, so that everybody knows what the, what the baseline is. And then a lot of these, um, a lot of the things that are in this guide, in fact, this guide is actually going to be probably used to certify um, implementers of this, like EHRs or vendors who are creating a, a guides for data access. So it's also helpful for the testing and the testier, testers and the testees to have a, a set of rules here. So this is actually creating a, a set of rules to test against as well. So we talk about, for example, shell support fetching, fetching a patient using the ID search parameter. And then I give two different syntaxes to be able to do that under the example. And then we talk about searching for patients by identifier, such as an MPI, and I give an example there. So we're kind of starting to create the requirements for um, um, an EHR in the quick start section for search. We define the search parameter in a separate section where we talk about the uh, supported ands, ors, and all the modifiers. Yeah. So in the in the later in the earlier guides, we didn't we didn't we didn't say anything about search parameters. In this latest guide, I actually say <coughs> I actually says in there, you shall support the ors, you shall support the ands, or you should, or you should, and it doesn't specify it in here. It specifies in other ones. If you look at the guide, you'll see where it actually does say we support that and we don't support that. So in this case, it's actually not specified. <clears throat> okay, we talked about extensions before. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so when you search for a resource ID, you, you can use the underbar, underbar ID to use that as a search parameter for searching for the resource ID. That's different from an identifier. Yeah. Identifier is a business identifier. The resource is a resource ID. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so these are the extensions that we have in the U.S. Core guides. We have four of them. These are all U.S.-centric extensions. You have a um, direct email extension, U.S. Core race, U.S. Core ethnicity, and a birth, birth sex extension. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, so value sets, terminology. Like I said, we bind a lot of the, the data elements to U.S. core specific terminology. And some of those we take from the, the base specification and just say, instead of being recommended, now we're requiring them. We're increasing the, uh, the conformance level on them. Others are, are, um, are specific to, to the U.S. core at, and, and U.S. realm. The value sets um, are a place where um, we spend a lot of time 
And we have a lot of different kinds of value sets in the implementation guide. For example, here's a problem value set for the, for the um, um, diagnosis problem list. And in this case, we, based on the US regs, are, are, are binding it to um, SNOMED. And in this case, there's a lot of those, right? So when you look at the guide, sometimes you'll see little notes here, a little red, red or pink boxes says this has more, than, more values than we care to publish when we expand it out. And that happens in some cases. Some of our value sets are huge, right? They're all a SNOMED. You know, you can't publish that. So when you look at the guide, you may see, we get a lot of comments about this. So I'll mention this. Well, you're not listing all the codes because it's too big. You can't do that. So, and in some cases, we have a value set that has um, uh, intellectual property restrictions on it, so we can't even publish it. And so the AMA says, no, you can't publish this. So we can't give you a list. We can just describe it. We can define it, but we can't actually, we can't even actually list it out. So. So there's that too. But a lot of value sets are pretty short and enumerated like a smoking uh, set value set, a smoking status value set, which <clears throat> gives you a set of loin codes that have, been, that have been somehow chiseled in stone for time immemorial since the CCDA times, right? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, terminology that's, that's encapsulated in the US core guide and the hope and the dream is at some point that we can port some of that out to uh, the value set authority and let them do the heavy lifting and we just point to them and we'll, hopefully we'll get there soon. Um, <clears throat> there's one API in the, in the, in the um, US core guide. What time does this, this talk go over? I want to make sure I'm on time here. Does anybody know? 4.30? Yeah, okay, eight minutes. Okay, I want to make sure I'm getting through this. One operation, which is a way to get um, on, we call so-called on-demand documents. Some documents aren't actually stored. They are created on demand. So we have a, an operation to do that. And I'm not gonna get into the details of this, but <clears throat> it's available for, for creating a, um, kind of documents on the fly. We call them on-demand officially. Um, I talked a little, I'll talk a little about capability statements. These are, these are uh, important for a, a, a small but important group of folks that read these guys, <clears throat> oftentimes the vendors that are, that are trying to certify to a specific standard and the testing authorities that are testing, because they base their testing on the capabilities that we're defining in the guide. <clears throat> so it's a, what's a capability statement look like? It's a bunch of shalls and shoulds and what you should need to support. So um, again, a lot of search involved in here. So we have uh, a profile that we support for patient and we have the search criteria and what what operations are needed and so forth. So it's a lot of you shall do this, you should do this. And if you look in that little box in the, in the corner there, we actually support, <coughs> we actually state that you need to support these combinations of searches. Okay, now I wanna to get to the future of Argonaut and US Core. Now remember, Argonaut went down the road and changed the US Core. So <coughs> when we talk about Argonaut R4, it's really US Core R4. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so in the Argonaut community, we encourage to use US Core rather than writing our own Fire SCU guide, hence why we're using US Core, why I'm calling it US Core. And so we're gonna take, we actually have, have, are starting to work on the R4 guard. We're taking the US Core R4 and taking a second look at it in the Argonaut community. Um, um, we have other things going on in Argonaut, including subscriptions, provenance, CDS hooks, and data query testing. Well, data query testing is taking the, Arctic, the last item there, Argonaut data query testing on R4, is actually taking our, our US Core R4 guide, testing it, and making sure that it's, you know, it's rigorous enough, and then if we find any issues or we discover issues, which we have, and I'll have all the issues list in a second, that will bring it back and do an update on R4, because then that eventually, um, the anticipation is that will become part of, of the, um, the ONC certification rules. There's another, in that list of uh, developments for, for Argonaut and our projects for 2019, we have subscriptions, provenance, and provenance, our hope and dream, and I think we'll get to this, is to take the provenance project within Argonaut and also wrap that into US Core. So we'll have a, actually have a section on provenance that we'll be putting in the US Core, and hopefully that'll be all completed by this fall. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to point out, uh, to get into US Core, we have a full journey, 
And so it's a bunch of steps. We really want to have stuff that's really mature before we say it's a candidate for putting in the US core. There's also a, a way to get to the head of the line. So a way to cheat. If you're a, a federal authority and say, this shall be so, it goes to the head of the line. So that's why USCDI made its way right to the front of the line without having to go through any of these steps. Our ground rules for um, continuing to work on, on US Core as Argonaut Fire R4 is to reuse the US Core profiles. We talked about that. <clears throat> and then we'll identify issues and we'll report them back to HL7 to be fixed in a fall update. New profiles, such as provenance, are going to be included in the IG before it's being, being ported. And I got a spelling error. And then anything that's not planned um, to, be, to be moved into US Core is going to be out of scope for the, the Argonaut R4 um, plans. And we're going to create some additional samples and guidance specific to data query access. Uh, we have a bunch of open issues that we started working on. Um, we have some issues with, with hidden default values that are being used by EHR vendors that we have to address. We have the must support issue. We have to clarify that and everything in between. Um, we have a few um, new data elements like Inspired O2 concentration we have to work through and um, um, UDI testing and planning and so forth. So um, we have a few things to get through. Hopefully we'll get it done by the fall and, and update our US Core guide and bring it back to HL7 and have something uh, that we can all be happy about and, and then have something certifiable and testable. So we have, uh, as, far as, as far as our Argonaut plans, we have a sprint plans. So when we say sprint, we're talking about these virtual connectathons where we <coughs> have servers set up and we have people test out their, their capabilities and see if they basically um, can meet all the, the search requirements that we're talking about. And then their, their uh, implementations are A, validate based on the guide, valid, they're valid um, to the profiles, and also that they meet the search criterion. And so we, we've started, we started with a few, we've kind of on ramp with some easy, we think easy stuff, patient allergy encounters. We're going to labs, observations, going to move on to medication requests and kind of run through all the, um, the profiles that are in US Core and try to make sure we, we've covered all our bases and uncovered anything that we need to update in our next version. And um, if you want to participate in the sprints, we certainly welcome that either as a, as a server or as a client. Um, just contact me or Brett, and we will certainly let you know how to do that. We have, we have a bunch of artifacts where you can actually find endpoints, and, and it's all done virtually and offline. <clears throat> and then other ways to participate, we have um, issues on GitHub. Do you have Zulip chat channels? And we have a connectathon coming up in Atlanta in, in, in our HL7 meeting in September, where we'll bring all our updates to US Core and, and get together and do an actual face to face connectathon. And we have some contacts here. Let me see if I have, oops, that's the end of the slideshow. I'll have to make sure we get some um, contact information in the guide as far as emails and so forth. But at this point, um, I would like to entertain questions. It, it says we're, we're finished at 4.30, is that right? Okay, wow, I got done with a minute to spare. So I have a minute for questions, I'll certainly stay longer. But um, <clears throat> so right now, we're really just beginning to ramp up the Argonaut work to review US Core um, R4 and discover any issues, make sure that it's good for A, for ONC certification testing and then to see how we can make it better so that it can be used as its, its aspiration is to be the base, baseline for US, core, US realm implementations. And so uh, just one more comment, then I'll go. The, the way we designed this guide, the, the struggle we've had is we want to have a relatively high barrier to ad adding new things to US core, relatively high. It has to be really a good reason, and it has lots of implementation experience, and we know that vendors are going to use it. And then on the opposite hand, we want to have a low very low or minimum barrier to actually being able to implement it. So we want it to be easy to use. So that's why we want to make it pretty difficult to add new stuff to the, to the guide. So yes, sir. I noticed you uh, used the prefix US Core for your extensions. I'm wondering, one, is that a pattern that you would recommend other um, extension writers continue with? Let's say naming it, uh, using a namespace effectively as a prefix. If any debate went on around that, I imagine that was a hot topic. 
That should have been a hot topic, I think. Um, although, I'm sorry, the question is, on my extensions, I don't know if I can go back to it. We prefaced the, the extension name so it has a, you know, it has a, a long URL. And we prefaced the name with US Core. And that's kind of a, I, I have to say, I'll be honest, I haven't thought about that in a while. And I'll, I probably should go back and look at that. I don't know if I can find them. <clears throat> here we go. <coughs> if you look up here, if you look at the top, go US Core Race, and you go over that thing that says URL, HTTP, blah, 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 US Core Race. That was the convention we chose because then it helps if you have another extension out there called <coughs> Race. It's not confusing, although I don't know that the base has US slash core structure definition. It could be race. That's a discussion that I think we get to clarify. This is kind of a convention I stuck with, but that's a very good question. I never really thought about that until after the fact, and now it's kind of what we've, we've stuck with. And I should go forward and say we don't have, in some, play, in some spaces, I'm maybe speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of anybody else, but I think we need to maybe um, tighten up our naming conventions for things like that. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I went back there. So are you, you, you mentioned in the beginning, the, the question was on a create and update transaction, and then you talked about the must support having a warning that gets tagged onto the must support elements? Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So one thing I'm going to clarify is we, we don't really talk about create or update in the guide. There's one section where we do. So it's mostly a search guide. It's mostly a get. OK. Um, but um, there is one spot where we do talk about being able to write clinical notes. And, and I haven't really thought about your question, but it's probably a good question. Maybe you can come down and let, tell it to me again, and I can write it down. But we haven't really addressed that. Yeah. It's, a, it's called, a, yeah, the doc ref operation, you're asking about that if it's on the fly. Yeah, in, in, a, in a classic get for a document reference. Yeah, exactly. The version for that, is it always one or can you omit it? Because technically it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's a <laughs> so the question is on a doc ref, on a doc ref operation, what's the version of that? Yeah. One, isn't it? It's always one. Okay. <laughs> That I, I haven't specified. That's a good question. I'll have to ask some people about whether there's a right official answer for that. Is John here? No. OK. OK. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, 